Hey, folks, welcome to another episode of Draft Talk on Pittsburgh Sports Live. I'm Alan Saunders. That's Nick Faribault. We're talking the 2022 NFL Draft and the Pittsburgh Steelers every day leading up to the draft, which is now just two days away on Thursday night. Nick, uh, today we're going to get back into our position-by-position review of this draft class as we've been doing throughout, and we're running out of time. We're talking, we don't have any days left uh, to get to all these positions, but we're going to hit the interior of the offensive line today, the centers and the guards. I think um, it's a position where the Steelers have an interesting need. They have a potential upgrade need, but they don't really need a depth need or a future need, if that makes sense. I, I think it all depends on how you feel about the guys the Steelers have in those positions so let's let's start out the conversation by just sort of breaking down what the Steelers have right they have Kendrick Green who was the starter at center last year they have Kevin Dotson who was the starter at left guard last year they have James Daniels so they brought in on a very expensive free agent contract who could play any of the three interior positions they have Mason Cole who they brought in on a free agent contract who can play probably any of the three interior positions they have JC Hassenauer who played better than Kendrick Green did, I think, down the stretch of the, the 2021 season. And can has also played guard, although I think he's probably mostly limited to center. And then they have John LeGlue, who started, I don't know, the last half of the season at guard, last third of the season at guard, and seemed okay at it anyway. Not wasn't like the, he was the worst of their linemen. So there's a lot of options there. It's not like it's a position desperate for depth. Uh, Mike Tomlin talked yesterday about just, hey, we're going to let things play out how they play out. Doesn't seem like he has a predetermined plan. I think you can make that group of personnel work in any number of different ways. How big of a need is this for the Steelers and how easy is that group? How easily will that group be upgraded on? Well, I, I still think if you get the right value, you should take one early. Uh, that's just my opinion. I don't think they will, um, but I, I would. Um, I'm still not confident in anyone aside from James Daniels. Um, I think James Daniels is the cornerstone you have of this franchise. Young player that has been a really good guard and center in this league. Can play whatever position you want. He can play all three interior spots and play them really well. In fact, I, I'm in favor of James, da- James Daniels at center, but that's just my opinion. I would play Daniels at center. I'd probably play Dotson at one guard spot, and then I'd let Green and Cole be at the other. Um, that's what I would do. Um, but again, that leaves room because if you're letting Green and Cole compete for one, then okay, you could probably draft a Zion Johnson and be okay. Let's just plug him in there and start. That would be an upgrade. Um, and then you look at Kevin Dotson, and he's had great flashes, but we haven't seen it yet. And it felt like just as he was turning the corner last year, his season ended because of the bad high ankle sprain he suffered. So that was that was the real blow. And so Dotson had a had a really good rookie year. Um, in limited spurts and then last year started off playing not really as good as well as he did the year before and then as he started to get going it you know during that Lions game specifically I thought he played really well until they got hurt and then it felt like he was starting to get things going but he wasn't good last year so I want to talk about Kevin Dotson's season because like or, or just in general I feel like a lot of Steelers fans are like yeah Kevin Dotson he's the left guard and I I like Kevin Dotson I I I loved him as a prospect when they drafted him. I thought it was a great pick. I, I I like his potential. But you have to look at the resume there. I mean, this is a fourth-round pick who played four games his rookie year, played them pretty well, but it's four games, then had his condition in question by his coach, got injured in training camp, uh, didn't play all that well at the beginning of the season, kind of started to get his game around and got injured again. I mean, he's played less than one full season of football, has suffered two major injuries, may or may not be in great shape, and was a fourth-round draft pick for legitimate reasons. I mean, this guy's far from a sure thing to be a, a, a regular everyday starter, and I think that's the reason the Steelers went out and got not one but two interior offensive line options. I think very clearly they needed to replace Trey Turner at right guard. Very clearly there are some question marks about – whether Kendrick green can stick at center and whether he's good enough at center to, to be a starter in this league. But I mean, really to me, they have three question marks coming into this off season. And James Daniels is the only one answer to those questions that feels solidified to me. Yeah. And that's the thing that this group has the potential to be really good or has the potential to be really bad again. Right. I mean, we are talking about a group that has a lot of upside. If, for example, if Kendrick green finds his, potential and capitalizes that into actual action and play we're talking about Kendrick Green being a a much better player we're talking about him being a legitimate player 
if Kevin Dotson gets back on his consistent level that he he could potentially get back on, I think that you'll see that, you know, happen. But it's just as easily possible that Dotson continues down that path where he doesn't play well. Kendrick Green never takes a step forward. And then you're starting Mason Cole. And not to be rude to Mason Cole, he's just not very good. Um, I mean, Mason Cole is a it, – it, it, I think ideally for me, my starting lineup, and this is, again, this is a, probably not going to be the popular take. I don't think there's many people spouting this. I would p- put Daniels at, at center. I would actually flip Dotson to right guard, and then I would put Green at left. That's what I would do. Those are what they played in college. I think that they are their natural positions. I think that that's where they're probably most comfortable with. And so that's where I would play these three guys. And that's what my starting lineup would be. And people are going to be like, but they paid Mason Cole like $5 million. And yeah, it's starter money. They probably will start Mason Cole somewhere. But ideally, his tape screams to me, interior backup swing man, and which he's a good swing man. But he's not ideally your starting left guard, your starting right guard, your starting center, wherever he ends up. And so I'm kind of, you know, hoping that they see that step from Kendrick Green, because I think Kendrick, I think they have set it up to at least give Kendrick Green a chance to prove himself at center guard, wherever he has an opportunity here to crack that lineup somewhere. If he takes that next step. And if he doesn't, we could just as easily see a Mason Cole start uh, someone like that. And I've also, and I also say this, I think that they've given Kevin Dotson a little bit of notice warning here too. Like, Hey, if you don't show up the training camp and we, we've heard the reports that they're not, they, they're not as enthralled with Kevin Dotson as I think everyone else is in the fan base, for example, um, and, and I think there's some validity to it. I don't think it's the full truth, but I do think that there's some validity to it. And if Kevin Dotson doesn't play well and say green surges, well, who's going to start probably Kendrick green. I mean, that, that's a scenario too. So that that's my thoughts though. Right now, those would or be how I would use the interior, those three guys. Um, but again, as you kind of said, there's a lot of question marks here. And I think you can look at the interior and say, yeah, we could add a guy here and we would not pr- be worse off. So much like I feel like we talked about inside linebacker to me, I, I feel like those needs are very closely correlated right now. It's like you have guys. Okay. And, and uh, again, even maybe more so than inside linebacker here, these needs are not immediate thoughts on this two years left on his rookie deal. Uh, Cole and D- Daniels are signed for three years. Green has three years left on his rookie deal. So like they have, they have time with the guys they have. It's just, can you make an upgrade on the players that are on your roster? They don't need depth. They don't need bodies. They don't even really have a future need. It's just, can you get a player that's better than one of these guys that you have that's currently projected into one of these starting jobs or one of these starting competitions? To me, that says, if you don't do it on the first two rounds, you're not going to do it, right? Yeah. I mean, again, I I kind of feel like that inside linebacker comparison is very apt um, because, again, you have guys where theoretically – if everything works out, this could be a good unit. I mean, it could be a good unit where it's not like it's not decided. These are young guys that are at the position. It's completely possible. Kevin Dotson rebounds. It's completely possible. You see the next step forward for Kendrick Green. The, but the thing is, just like Miles Jack is that one answer in the inside linebacker room, and you're kind of hoping, okay, I get something from Devin Bush. Maybe Buddy Johnson gets in here somewhere. Um, like you're hoping for those two things, but Miles Jack's your only sure thing. But on this interior, your only sure thing is James Daniels. So if you see someone, in my opinion, you get the right value on a Zion Johnson. If you get the right value on a Kenyon Green, if you get the right value on Tyler Linderbaum, like if you get value on one of those guys, and this would probably be a trade back scenario where you trade back from 20 because you aren't feeling what's going on and you don't like the board. So you trade back. Say they do that, uh, the, the one hypothetical trade they threw out yesterday where they trade back from 20 to 32. Um, and, and you get one of those three sitting there, 32. Like that is the one scenario where you're like, okay, we, we have a future need here. And well, Kenny Green and Tyler Linderbaum are still on the board. I mean, I, I would take a chance at them there. Um, but like that's a scenario where you could see it. But again, they really haven't shown a ton of interest in the interior alignment. I mean, not that, you know, it hasn't been there. They have shown some interest. The Georgia guys, uh, LSU, they've shown interest in those guys to a degree. Um, but it's not been plentiful. So it, it's something to look at. Pat, now, Pat Meyer was at Texas A&M's Pro Day. So Kenyon Green is on the table to a degree, but we'll see. 
Yeah, I mean, they, these are not guys that Tomlin and Colbert saw. Um, none of them, actually. And and really, as, as far as I'm concerned, that's it, right? I mean, those are the guys that even, even talking about day two options, there aren't really a lot, right? Like, to me, those are the three guys that seem like, okay, they're clear upgrades on what the Steelers have. After that, it becomes less clear and I think not really worth the draft capital at that point. Yeah, essentially. And, and that's how you're going to rock with it because – you don't have it, it, it. The Steelers are fickle in this way because they are, I think, the only team you have this kind of pro day tracker for, um, which it's just so heavily correlated. I mean, the basically, and, and I'm going to live and die by the sword of the pro days because until Kevin Colbert, Mike Tomlin give you a reason to not die by that sword, it's followed that entire trend. And so, interior O line is, it doesn't appear to be one of their big priorities. I think that they spent big money in free agency to try to avoid drafting an interior offensive lineman early. That was one, if you remember, this was one of the positions that Kevin Colbert said was thin um, at the beginning of the draft cycle. He thought this was a thin position. So maybe they don't like the class. And so they went out and got a few free agents to fill some of those voids. And, and you still get the young guys going there. You give chances for guys like Green. Dotson gets a chance. You even give chances for like Lou and Hassenauer if they really – show out to give opportunities yeah, I thought to those guys, guys were fine last year like I, I mean yeah. I don't think they were good but they're certainly like deserving of an NFL roster spot I'm, I'm very comfortable with their backup situation even if they don't have great starters and, and it's competition right I mean e- even I don't think even J- maybe outside of Daniels I and I don't know where he's gonna play I don't expect Tomlin to say like here's our starters uh the first day OTAs like they're the, even though LeGlue and Hassenauer are guys without pedigree and maybe have a a limited ceiling i think they're going to provide real competition in that group and i don't know to me i feel like this is a you get one of those three guys that falls to you in a situation maybe a trade back scenario um and and interestingly you know, that trade back to 32 you know that nets them another top 75 pick probably right a, a mm-hmm. high third round pick like yeah that's that's desirable if the board doesn't we talked about yesterday we think it's going to be a quarterback in the first round, but if, if that sort of nightmare scenario for the quarterback class happens where you're talking about, you know, two or three guys going in the top 10, the Steelers not even really getting close to being able to pick who they want. I think a trade down to 32 is very realistic. And at that point, I do think Linderbaum green and Zion Johnson become very realistic possibilities. Not all three of them will be there, but I think one of them will probably get to the end of the first round. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think Kenny green, you would put more weight there because Pat Meyer was at his pro day. Um, and there are Texas A&M ties there. He was in Linder Bombs too, right? I, I'm, no, I think he was. I don't believe he was. So okay. that, that's, they went to. They sent somebody to Linder Bombs. I thought it was him. I don't think Pat Meyer was there. Okay. Um, and so that's like pretty big. So, um, yeah, like not sending him to Iowa's pro day. Yeah, they sent Phil Kreidler to Iowa. Okay. Um, which is significant. Um, Phil Kreidler is one of those guys that has some sway because he's such a tenured vet in that room. But um, I don't think that it showcases more interest because they sent, you know, the sending. They're going to send a at, scout to every major pro. Yeah. But like sending up your position coach showcases a little bit different level of interest to me. So in a trade back scenario, I would highlight Kenyon Green as a potential pick um, here. And you know, Kenyon Green is, I mean, I don't know what Kenyon Green's stock is going to be at this point. He didn't really have a great combine. He didn't test very well, um, which is kind of a little surprising. I mean, I never thought he was a great athlete, but he really didn't test very well. And so that has kind of hurt his stock a little bit. Um, so, I mean, maybe we're talking about a scenario where Kenny Green gets to 52, honestly. Like, that isn't crazy, I don't think. After the the range of an easy trade-up from 52 if they want to do that as well. Yeah. And we've talked about some other players in that range. I I do think it's possible. I also think if they're going to make that move, I think it's much more likely to be for a guy that can play center. Um, I just Mm -hmm. feel like the the – you know, I, I think J- James Daniels can play center and I think he can be a good center, but I think really all of their options are probably better guards. Um, yeah. And green. So green has different type of versatility. He doesn't have center guard. He has guard tackle. So, I mean, that could be really attractive to them as well because they do need a backup tackle. They need a fourth tackle in that rotation. So, 
maybe that's attractive to them if they get there where he can be kind of that emergency tackle. Um, but I, I would agree that they would look at maybe guard, you know, more so, you know, maybe a guy. Like Zion you know, like, has that flexibility. Now he's not going to get to 52, mm -hmm. but I think he has that, that flexibility to, to play center that I think would make him more attractive for them. As far as day three options go, I, I, I don't think, there's really any point in talking about him because I think John LeGlue and JC Hassenauer have those spots and there's not really any reason to try to replace those guys. Now there is, I think in that round three range, I think there are a few guys to kind of take a look at, you know, guys like um, Jamari Salyer from Georgia <laughs> is an interesting yeah, name. Listed as a tackle by a lot of people, but I think probably a guard in the NFL and a, yeah. a player I do like. Like Jamari Salyer. I think Ed Ingram from uh, LSU has worked his way up into that day two conversation. Um, Dylan Parham from Memphis, I think, is an interesting name in that area. Um, I, I mean, there are some guys here that you can you, you can see them maybe looking at. Um, I think always keep an eye out on the Kentucky guys, um, at least to a degree. Um, you know, Kennard, Fortner, those are two guys to take a look yeah, at. We talked about Kennard when we talked about tackles, but again, I think he also is probably best suited to be a guard in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And, and, and could him and Sally or I, I do, I do like as a sort of like, but I think if they drafted either of them, they would start them as the fourth tackle. Like, yeah. And then maybe they would move them to guard eventually, you know, just because that's yeah. a bigger depth need right now than the interior of the offensive line is. Yeah. I think though, interest wise, I think based on their pro day travel, I think you would probably look at Ingram, Sally or, Kennard and Fortner those four because yeah. you know Brandon Hunt was at Kentucky Pro Day and I, I do weigh Brandon Hunt heading to Pro Days a little bit more heavily than anyone else he's not just another scout again we're talking about who we think is the GM and waiting here um in Brandon Hunt so anytime he shows up at a Pro Day I it, it turns my eyes a little bit because he has a pretty good correlation um with getting guys drafted for wherever he goes and he was at the Kentucky Pro Day so this is significant to a degree um, I think that you can, you know, other guys that could fit in there, like Cam Jurgens from Nebraska, um, Lacia Smith, Cole Strange, but like we haven't seen the type of interest. Um, I, I will say this, you know, they were at North Carolina Pro Day and Joshua Azeadu, um is one of those really athletic alignment, interior alignment that is capable of playing different spots. Just so happened to be, obviously they were there for Sam Howe, but they probably got a little nice view of Azeadu as well while they were there. Um, so that could be something to watch. And then also uh, at Alabama, you saw Chris Owens there, kind of a, a, a half an hour type of dude that can do a lot of different things, pl has played all five positions on the offensive line. I think that's a very attractive pick for the Steelers maybe. And then there's Justin Schaefer, the other full, uh, Georgia guy as well. Uh, he was at the Senior Bowl. I thought he actually had a pretty good week down there. Yeah, I like both um, so of you guys at the Senior Bowl. Yeah, I did too. And and so, you know, some day three guys we're talking about, there's like Chase and Hans from LSU. I, I um, really don't think there's like a lot of, like, I don't think day three guys are going to the Steelers. I just don't. I don't see, I don't see the fit. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. I don't know. I, mean, I could see them taking a the guy like Andrew Varstidis. Um, I think he makes sense as like a center guy, um, a team captain type of guy that works in a zone offense. That one makes a little bit of sense to me. Um, I think you could see them take a swing on a guy like Thayer Munford. You know, one of these vet guys that's kind of polished and ready to come out. Um, a Z Xavier Newman-Johnson, I think, would be a really interesting fit because he's a super athletic guard, really juiced up guard. A Donovan West is a really interesting player. Again, there's a lot of really interesting athletic zone-oriented centers here, and, I, and like that's the type of guy I could see them drafting on day three because they don't really have another zone-oriented center other than Kendrick Green. Um, I mean, they do. It's James Daniels and, and Mason yeah. Cole, but you know they don't have a true like center center. Um, and like Colt Col Daniels is a true center, but he's probably going to end up playing guard. Is my my prediction? Yeah. Cole's kind of the opposite, um, where he's probably more of a true guard. I mean, his center tape is kind of rough, man. Um, but you look at at a guy like Donovan West, who's really athletic. Um, I mean, you see Fortner who's a powerful dude, but is athletic enough to work in that zone heavy rush attack. I mean, there are a lot of guys in this class that fit that zone scheme and we've seen them move a lot more towards wide zone stuff, some things like that, but they run a ton of split and inside zone. So the zone stuff is, is big and key for the Steelers. It's Matt Canada's bread and butter. 
Um, so they have a lot of interesting center prospects I think they can look at here, center guard capable guys on day three. And if they end up drafting one, I think it's going to be someone that can maybe come in and compete and push maybe half an hour or someone like that as a more athletic upside type of guy. I can see it. I just think the other needs are much more pressing on day three. And actually, let's flip and talk about one of those right now. Another one that Mike Tomlin talked about yesterday, and that's the running back position where uh, the Steelers have obviously Najee Harris uh, entrenched as a starter and a very good one. Uh, the, the player they used their first round pick on last year, but behind him, not a whole lot. They let Kalen Balazs walk as a free agent. They've got Kenny. Uh, Benny Snell and and Anthony McFarland, but neither of those players has really impressed. McFarland uh, injured last year and never really seemed to get any traction. After that, Snell, a couple of years of, of pretty mediocre production, seems to be trustworthy with the football and, and able to to be a tough runner when he has to be, but, but a, a player with not dynamic athleticism and, and doesn't seem to have a ton of power either. I think this is a, a hugely untalked about need for this team to, to find some functional depth behind Najee Harris. I mean, some like what would happen if Harris would get hurt? I mean, that, that to me is he does not have a gentle running style. Um, he, he's, you know, he's not running out of bounds and, and, and leaving hits on the table. And so I just, and they don't even really have a good change of pace, let alone someone that could fill those shoes for an injury, I do think it's it's something that they absolutely need to address in this draft. And Mike Tolan basically said, without really saying, that they're going to find some competition there. They need to do it. One, because to me, it's not smart to run Najee into the ground every year. I mean, you're trying to – if you spend a first-run pick on that running back, you're trying to prolong his career as, as long as possible. Um, and so Najee can't – in my opinion, he can't get as many touches as he did last year. Now – Obviously, you love what Najee brings to the table, but him touching the ball as much as he did. I mean, he led the NFL in snap share. He led the NFL in touches from that running back position. So he is a volume monster. I mean, that follows the Mike Tomlin MO of running backs, but I don't like that MO and you would like to see it change. Um, but I also just think, yeah, if Najee gets hurt, and he did last year, at the end of last year, you remember that awkward tackle um, in that Baltimore game. And he never – he didn't feel like he was the same player um, against Kansas City, first of all. He wasn't as violent because he just – I mean, he was with one arm, right? So he's more focused about, quite honestly, not fumbling the football with the other arm. Um, and then he tried to come back against Baltimore, did it. But when, remember when he was out against Baltimore, the Steelers just got, like, ne negative from that position. I mean, they got absolutely nothing from the running back position when Najee was out of the game last year, straight up. Um, I, I can't remember. I don't think I, I don't know if I remember a big play by Kalen Balaj, Benny Snow, or Anthony McFarland at any point last year uh, that actually was eye popping uh, to a degree. Um, so like that is the big thing is they don't have another guy that anyone fears. So if, if he gets hurt, I mean, they are, they are screwed to be quite honest with you. Uh, and that's going to be huge for the offense because He's a huge part of what they do offensively. So if you lose Najee Harris, you lose a lot. So you need someone that can at least be a competent back, an available back, and someone that act teams actually have to fear. It's not hard. And, and this is the crazy thing to me is that this team's been bad at evaluating running backs post-James Conner. Um, James Conner was the last big hit. Uh, outside, obviously, Najee was a hit, but he was a first-round pick. Uh, it's pretty rare to miss on a first round running back, to be quite honest with you. Um, so you look. Nobody at, wants one. <laughs> yeah, no one wants one. And so and there's when, not going to be one taken this year, right? No. And so when usually when you take a first round running back, they're usually really talented. And that's kind of what happened with Najee. And so he's, gonna, he's a good player, of course. And so that's a hit, but they spent huge capital on that. But they just haven't been able to hit in the later rounds. Uh, you look at guys like Benny Snell, Jalen Samuels. Um, you look at, at Anthony McFarlane. I mean, they haven't hit on any archetype of running backs. I mean, you look at, at kind of Colbert's history of drafting running backs. It's really not that strong. I mean, look at his day three history. It's McFarland, Snell, Samuels, Chris Rainey, Baron Batch, Jonathan Dwyer, Cedric Humes, Noah Heron, and JT Wall. I mean, that is a dreadful list. For your day, second round looks back. good. James Conner and Lev Bell, but I mean, they're not spending that high capital on one this year, you know? Right, exactly. So that's kind of the thing is they're going to have to draft the day three running back. And all I'm saying is Kevin Colbert's 
resume on day three running backs is not exactly stellar. Not very good. So well, let's talk about the options. I mean, I think there are easily a half a dozen guys that seem to fit the bill of what the Steelers need that will be taken in that day three range. Um, who do you like? And and who, I, I know who I like, but I'll let you go first. Who, who do you like? And and who do you see as a good fit for the team? I like Pierre Strong from South Dakota State. Uh, that's a very interesting pick. I really like Pierre Strong. Great straight line speed. You have a dude that runs really low, runs with great pad level, physical, and a guy that didn't get a ton of work in terms of the actual passing game. And when he did, he was really good at it, was really good uh, in the all-star games with that. He did a really nice job, and he's got all that vision that he has. He's a one-cut zone runner. I think they could use that. I think he's a really fun player. Um, Another guy I really like is Hassan Haskins from Michigan. I think he's a good player as well. Really physical. This guy's a type of of Steelers guy. You're talking 6'1", 220. But a guy that is ready to play right now, has enough burst to beat you to the edge. A guy that's a real grinder, but not too much of a grinder. He's not a Benny Snell type grinder. He's got legit tread and speed on his wheels. So I think that's really actually something there. He's a jackhammer with actual speed, which is something the Steelers have just not been able to hit with their type of archetype. And also really good in pass pro. That's always something that you look for with the Steelers. I think Ty Chandler's a really interesting type of look at as well. Big time home run speed. Um, there's a few guys here, you know, Snoop Connor, Tyler Algier from BYU is, is that's I think, my the big one. I, I think Tyler Algier is a perfect fit for what the Steelers want. A very responsible pass uh, defender. You know, he can he can just stay there and take up blocks. It honestly reminds me of like a throwback fullback. Like not the sort of like big, tough fullback, uh, but like those sort of like Larry Centers, John L. Williams kind of fullback where, and if you're talking about a, a, a team that might want to play some two back sets, might want to play a little bit more of that with, you know, as Matt Canada has in the past, I could see him playing a little bit of running back fullback hybrid. He's a big dude. He ran a four, six though. I mean, it's not like he's slow. I wouldn't have Cole and I have like great burst, but he just runs hard. He reminds me a lot of James Connor. I mean, honestly, I, mm-hmm. like that yeah, sort yeah. Of very, very dependable, uh sturdy he's not does not have great burst and and a pretty good receiver for his size especially like you get him uh in in some isolation against a defensive back like out in the flat you know he'll catch the ball then you should be able to expect him to break a tackle and and i and i think that's um a really useful player specifically for what matt Canada is going to be looking to do he's used a lot of fullbacks and players h backs players like that in the past i think algier can both be a backup and a change of pace and also just be a sort of swiss army knife for for that offense yeah and that's the thing about algier is that you know we me and you discussed this at the combine and i was thinking i was like he kind of reminds me of james connor and he really does he, he plays a lot of the same way as james connor does and you know he's just one of those guys that's just there and he runs super hard has great vision like really a fun player. I mean, a, a really fun player um, that can work in multiple schemes, can run different types of styles. He has that burst to run different types of styles. But there's so many different running backs like in this class that the Steelers could look at. You talk about Algier. I talk about Hassan Haskins. Uh, Tyrion da- Davis Price from LSU is a really interesting player. Yeah, Zonovan Knight from NC State. I, I don't think you mentioned yet. He's a little bit mm-hmm. smaller, but I, I think a, an, another interesting guy that can do a lot of different things, maybe more of a, like a traditional change of pace back uh, mm-hmm. in that regard. Jerome Ford from Cincinnati, uh, very similar to me. Yeah. Uh, and and, um, and could, could be that sort of, you know, not that they're going to take Najee Harris off the field on third down, but like more of that like traditional third down back kind of role. Mm-hmm. I think you also look at a guy like Abram Smith from Baylor, who's a, a real great senior uh, bull man. I thought he was awesome. Yeah, I really like Abram Smith type of guy. I think Mike Tomlin would fall in love with just a real tough dude. I mean, that's tough as nails and, and super good in pass pro. And he really looked like an all around player. And he's I like his speed. He's not like blazingly fast, but I really like his speed for his size. He's a bigger guy, like, t- like compared to Knight or Ford. He's a bigger dude, and and I think he still runs pretty well. Yeah, and that's the thing. And so he's just a really good dude. I, I like him. I like the day three of this class a lot, and in the running back area, I think you're going to be able to find those guys that are good, um, kind of rotational guys. I mean, we didn't even mention some other guys. You know, like. 
you can look at a Kevin Harris, for example, from South Carolina. Um, that could be really interesting. Isaiah Pacheco from Rutgers. Um, Sincere McCormick from UTSA. Like, there are a lot of guys two Georgia here. guys either. I mean, I think Zamir White is probably maybe, maybe like – very early day three guy uh but james cook should be in that range as well i mean here's the question do you do you feel like the steelers would consider a running back with that fourth round pick i think it's a little bit early just because i think they have other needs that are more pressing but i think it'd be in consideration like because if then then you're bringing in you know zamir white kyron williams at that point becomes a possibility i mean we're talking about a different set of guys jerome ford pierre strong is there damian pierce that's where you're talking about, you know, all these different type of players that you could theoretically put in and Brian Robinson. Now you throw into the equation from Alabama. Yeah. Like, I think I, maybe if the Steelers traded down somewhere else and were able to add a pick, I think the fourth round would be reasonable. I just think without having that fifth, like that it's, it's, it's tricky. Right. And they're, they're, you know, they, I, I think they're probably going to need to use, you know, I think the, the realistic targets here are who falls from this group down into that sixth where they have two picks or the seventh round, because uh, I don't know. I just, it certainly could be that fourth though. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it really depends on how everything else falls above it. If they can check a lot of boxes ahead, I could see, I could see running back going in the fourth round. I, I really could, but like, that's also a place where we kind of circled as, as a good fit for tackle. It's also a good fit for corner for them. So, I mean, you can't take them all, but I like the way the fourth round running backs line up for them, but I think it's probably more likely this is a pick that waits until later. Yeah, I could see that happening. And that's the thing about, you know, this is that if they find the right guy, though, and the right guy falls to, to that 138, I mean, I would not roll out a running back there. Yeah, and I think, I mean, like, if you're talking about Algier, if you're talking about Ford, if you're talking about uh, Zamir White or um, – Cook or someone like that yeah, there. Yeah, like, that's where they would have to take them because of how far it is from there to their next pick. Like unless that that's the other thing is they can trade up or down and, and, you know, and around, you know, they could trade down from that pick in the fourth into the middle of the fifth and add another pick, uh, you know, and, and, and then those running backs start to look even more like a better fit for where their draft capital lines. Yeah. Up. And, and so I think that fourth round is the, the ceiling for this pick. Um, I don't see them taking oh, absolutely. Monday too. There's no so way like it's, it's the fourth round and then lower. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if they draft the one and then I think, I think they're going to draft one and add another in UDFA process. I think we're going to see two running backs added to this room because right now uh, there, I mean, there's four in that room. Uh, if not, not counting Derek Watt, there are four in that room right now between Trey Edmonds, Anthony McFarlane, Benny Snell and Najee Harris. And I feel like, you know, last year they only had five running backs and it felt like they they needed someone else in there. You know, it was like a, kind of a revolving door, like Pete Guerrero, Tony Brooks, James, some of these different guys were just coming in and out. And it never felt like there was any serious threat from the back half of that room last year. So I think they're going to add two running backs. Uh, I agree somehow, with that. Somehow. I mean, I think when we're sitting here talking about, oh, well, they have two backups that they don't really trust and don't want to use. Well, where's the pressure from below on those guys right like mm -hmm. Trey Edmonds I like the guy but I don't think he is that he is a guy that they could call up and use on special teams if they feel like they have an absence in that area though they really trust him I, I don't think they really see him as a threat to anyone's playing time at running back no and so you need someone to push both because it's completely possible you bring in two running backs and say I don't know you bring in Hassan Haskins and Letty Brown and both of those guys outperform Benny Snell. Oh, and I Andy love McFarlane. Letty Brown as a as a as a free agent guy. I love Letty Brown. And we talked about him after the West Virginia Pro Day, but I, I think he's a perfect fit for them. Might slip into the draft. I don't know, but uh, if he does not get drafted, or maybe even with that seventh round pick, if they don't take one earlier, I could see him as an option for yeah. them. But, but but just theoretically, you take Hassan Haskins and Letty Brown, and. They beat – I could see that your running back room being Najee Harris, Slade Brown, and, and Hassan Haskins. Like, that's not completely far-fetched. I think this is also a sneaky position you could see them if they're not happy heading into, you know, mini camp, training camp. This is an area where they can call up maybe a vet and see kind of – you know, the market's not exactly plentiful right now on the running back market. 
Um, but you, but usually what ends up happening is somehow, some way, one of these running backs ends up getting cut because the running back depth in the league is so absurd that you usually end up having some good running backs floating around on the waiver wire. So my guess is you're also going to see that if this position could potentially be a late add to the 53 man roster when it comes out, if they're not happy with this room, because I feel like there is going to be someone, you know, from like the 49ers or something, because they're just a running back factory. Um, Someone, you know, in this area, um, maybe you call what they did with a corner and just be like, well, let somebody else evaluate them because we're not that good at it. So let's bring in somebody else's. Yeah. Or you can, you know, you can call up a team with like really good depth, like, um, the Cowboys, for example, have Zeke Pollard and Rico Dowdle. And Rico Dowdle has showcased his ability to be a legit NFL back, but he's not going to play at all because it's Tony Pollard and Zeke, right? You're not going to play there. And yeah, you can never really have enough running back depth in the league. I feel like nowadays, just because the guys get hurt so often, it's such a it's such a physical oriented position. But maybe you can like flip a, a conditional seventh or sixth for a running back on one of these teams too. Like, I mean. I mean, honestly, when you look at or the find a spot where we talked about where the Steelers have a ton of depth and and trade one of those inside linebackers or one of those guards if they feel like yeah. they're not going to be able to use them, like a player like I mean, look at a player like John Leglue who like kind of came out of nowhere, doesn't seem to have that much value, probably not going to get used much by the Steelers, but he started like five games and did okay last year. Like that, that's worth yeah. a that's worth a, a lit, an end of the draft running back for sure. Uh-huh. I'll say I'll say this is an interesting name that came to my mind when I was thinking of the 49ers. Uh, so Elijah Mitchell had a big year last year. You still have Jeff Wilson Jr. there getting some real tread. Then Jamichael Hasty's there. Trey Sermon really didn't get used a lot last year. And part of it was injuries, but part of it was also that he just didn't exactly feel what they wanted. And rem- remember the Steelers showed a lot of interest in Trey Sermon last year. Like that's a possibility. I feel like they could flip one of their late round picks this year. Maybe we could see like an in draft trade for a player where they flip one of the, maybe one of those sevens or the six and maybe go get like Trey Sermon. Like that could be a possibility. I feel like, um, so like there, there are some possibilities here, but they're going to add two running backs and, and I would bet on that. And we're going to see competition come in. I mean, really Mike Tomlin told you he was going to add a running back yesterday. At least I think they end up adding two, one through the draft, one through the UEFA process, maybe sign another. So I think they're going to add to this running back room. I agree, and we will see exactly how that plays out. In the 2022 NFL Draft starts on Thursday. These running back picks we're talking about probably more Saturday morning. That's when the third day of the draft is. The Steelers will make their final uh, four selections there. Nick and I will have you covered all the way through to the end of the 2022 NFL Draft. And then before you know, it'll be time for a mini camp at OTAs and, and, and the football season will be on us. So stick with us here at Pittsburgh Sports Live. Hit like and subscribe to notifications so you get the first first message every time we have a new show here on the YouTube channel. You can also find us on anywhere you can find a podcast. That's Nick. I'm Alan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you tomorrow.